Funding for the production of this program was provided in part by Brigham Young University Religious Education. The Sidney B. Sperry Symposium is an annual academic conference held at Brigham Young University. The symposium honors the memory of former religious education instructor Sidney B. Sperry. The theme for the 2004 symposium is Prelude to the Restoration, From Apostasy to the Restored Church. This address by John Welch was given on October 30, 2004. Dr. Welch is a professor of law at BYU. I'm grateful to participate in this Sperry Symposium, and I want to thank the committee, the other speakers, and Sidney B. Sperry himself, whose writings and example still serve us so very well. My topic today is the Christian creeds and what they have to do with creating a condition that demanded renovation and restoration. In this brief survey, I hope to make a small contribution by providing a broad framework for understanding creeds as a part of the apostasy, and thus as an element in the prelude to the restoration by the prophet Joseph Smith. In general, it is clear that the creeds are a mixture of truth and error, of correctness and incorrectness, of bounty and boundary. On October 15, 1843, the prophet Joseph commented, I cannot believe in any of the creeds of the different denominations because they all have some things in them that I cannot subscribe to, though all of them have some truth. I want to come up into the presence of God and learn all things, but the creeds set up stakes and say, Hitherto shalt thou come, and no further, which I cannot subscribe to. While Joseph Smith and Latter-day Saints gladly and gratefully recognize that all religious creeds contain some truth, the problem is that those formulations also contain errors or impose limits, which as stated in the Encyclopedia of Mormonism are incompatible with the gospel's inclusive commitment to truth and continual revelation. Such mixing of truth and error is reminiscent of the parable of the wheat and the tares, the Lord's most salient teaching on the nature of the apostasy which was announced in Matthew chapter 13, clarified in JST Matthew 13, and applied to our day in Doctrine and Covenants 86. Thus the creeds themselves, as vessels of mixture, become symbols of the apostasy. The problem is discerning the right from the wrong, or the mission from the omission, and it is precisely that need to discern truth from error that required the new credible dispensation from God, not another creedal formulation from yet another think tank. With this general observation in mind, we should see the creeds as both cause and effect, both symptom and result, of the disturbing religious conditions that plagued the mind of the youthful Joseph Smith and, and drove him to the silent grove to seek and receive revealed solutions and a divine cure for his and the world's lack of wisdom. I will take the accounts of the first vision as our first guide. My question here is precisely what did the Lord communicate to Joseph in 1820 about the creeds and even more about the problems that they created or reflected? That information invites us to look at statements of belief from the times of the New Testament in contrast with the main creeds of early Christianity and finally on into the creeds of the Protestant churches in the early 19th century to show how creedal statements originally began and how they degenerated as time went on. First, what do we learn from the first vision? In his first vision in 1820, Joseph Smith was plainly told that Christianity had fallen off the original path most pleasing to God and that he should join none of their denominations. Joseph was told, as he reports in his 1838 account, the main culprit in this unfortunate ecclesiastical situation was the creeds. In response to his question, which of all sects was right, Joseph was instructed by the Lord that all their creeds were an abomination in his sight. I think it's significant that all of the creeds were a single abomination, not that each one individually necessarily might have been. 
This important disclosure by the Lord to Joseph Smith raises several questions. Which creeds might Jesus have had in mind? As we will see, many creeds existed in 1820, and they had been adopted by the various sects or denominations. What did those creeds say, and what was it about them that made them so odious? Were they each individually an abomination, or was the problem that all of them together created a single abomination due to confusions, divisions, and contentions that they had caused? Apparently, the latter. How did the creeds of 1820 relate to the earlier creeds of Christianity, such as the Apostles' Creed, the Nicene Creed, or the so-called but never officially adopted Athanasian Creed? How do these creeds differ? We can begin to answer these questions by marshalling all of the information learned by Joseph Smith about this subject, as reported in the ten surviving accounts that he gave of that seminal revelation. On the handout, you see a table compiling this data. While the 1838 account of the first vision is the only account to create, to, to mention the creeds specifically by using that particular word, most of the prophets' other surviving accounts of this vision contain equally unambiguous words to the effect that the people and the churches of his day had departed from the gospel, and for which reason, in four of the accounts, Joseph was told that he should join none of them. We learn three main things relevant to the present topic from these ten first vision accounts. First, the accounts of the first vision make it clear that the gospel had been preached originally in truth and purity, but that the world had strayed from it. Joseph's first account, handwritten in his journal in 1832, reports these words spoken by the Lord. The world lieth in sin at this time, and none doeth good, no, not one. They have turned aside from the gospel, and kept not my commandments. They draw near to me with their lips, while their hearts are far from me. In 1843, Levi Richards reported, Joseph is saying, that none of them were right, that they were all wrong, and the everlasting covenant, which originally was taught, had been broken. The covenant was once on earth, but had been broken and lost. Similarly, Joseph's last known account, recorded by Alexander Neibauer in his 1844 journal, emphasizes this same point. They are not my people, have gone astray, there is none that doeth good, no, not one, but this is my beloved Son, hearken ye him. Second, in particular, errors of doctrine had been introduced into the beliefs of the people. They teach for doctrines the commandments of men, we read in the 1838 account. In the Wentworth letter in 1842, Joseph similarly, de similarly declared that the two glorious personages who appeared before him told him that all religious denominations were believing incorrect doctrines, and that none of them was acknowledged of God as his church and kingdom. In early tracts by Orson Pratt in 1840 and by Orson Hyde in 1842, we see similarly emphasized points, that all denominations were believing in incorrect doctrines, and that all of them erred in doctrine. They have may, may have retained the form of godliness, but not the power and true essence thereof. Third, and most importantly, confusion, contention, and corruption had resulted in the lives of many who professed to be followers of Christ. This was the culminating and precipitating final blow. It is one thing for people to disagree with civility and kindness while pondering various inscrutable mysteries of divine truth. It is another thing for chaos and conflict to reign. Beginning as early as the age of 12, Joseph was pierced to the soul by the contentions and divisions and wickedness and abominations and darkness which pervaded the minds of mankind, as he said. In 1835, he similarly spoke of being wrought up in my mind respecting the subject of religion and looking at the different systems taught uh, by the children of men. In 1838, uh, the account drives home this same concern. Being torn by the tumult, so great and incessant as various professors of religion used all their powers of either reason or sophistry to prove their errors, or at least to make people think they were in error. 
Joseph turned to the Lord for mercy and help. He was told that those professors were corrupt, that they draw near to me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. This potent concern about corruption, an outgrowth of all the contention, was echoed again in Joseph's 1843 account. Significantly, as we go back into the history of Christianity from New Testament times down to 1820, history confirms this three-stage picture from original clarity to error to contention quite readily and thoroughly. Although it would require several volumes to explain and explore all of the questions posed above, in this lecture I propose to outline in broad strokes these three stages of creedal apostasy as brought to light in the First Vision accounts. Looking back on this historical development from our vantage point today leaves little doubt that the crisis of the creeds had gone far enough by 1820 that the Lord's voice should be raised in disapproval, warning, and correction. Starting with the time of the New Testament, it is evident that original Christian declarations of faith began as genuinely simple statements of testimony. Several declarations of belief are found in the New Testament, and some of them actually begin with the words, we believe, or I believe. Greek words that the Latin Vulgate then rendered as creditimus, or credo, from the Latin uh, word from which the English word creed directly derives, we see the basic idea of creedal declaration of faith presented in the essence of these pre-creedal statements in the Bible. Interestingly and appropriately, these biblical statements are notably characterized by their spontaneous individuality and their succinct focus on the Savior's divine roles and powers. But ironically, as so often happened in the apostasy, seeds that were divine and good at the outset were mingled with tares, corrupted and transformed beyond something that they were originally intended to be. In the case of the creeds, these biblical expressions of testimony may well have formed the root out of which the later creeds would grow, but only after many wild branches would be grafted onto these faithful stalks of believing declaration. One encounters in the New Testament a dozen pre-creedal statements of belief. They are short and unrehearsed, varied and flexible, and third, intensely personal. We would do well to follow this New Testament pattern in bearing our testimonies today. Consider three representative cases from the words of Nathaniel, Peter, and Paul. Other similar overt declarations of belief and testimony come from the eunuch speaking to Philip, from Paul and Silas in Philippi, and from the beloved apostle John. Nathaniel is the first reported disciple to verbally declare his inward recognition that Jesus of Nazareth was the Son of God. Nathaniel, who was taken by Philip to see him, of whom Moses and in the law and of the prophets did write, was greeted by Jesus, Behold, an Israelite, indeed, in whom there is no guile. When Jesus said that he had seen Nathaniel under the fig tree, this disciple broke forth immediately in testimony, Rabbi, thou art the Son of God, thou art the King of Israel. No one had told Nathaniel what to say. His declaration is pure and unformulaic, short, spontaneous, and unrehearsed. Nor is there any reason to believe that this scripture is not historical. For what Christian community, Johannine or otherwise, would have called Jesus Rabbi or the King of Israel as a matter of institutional confession from which Nathaniel's statement could otherwise have been derived? Nathaniel's short statement fits especially into the Galilean context of Jesus' earliest ministry, right where it belongs. Peter's bold statements of belief in Jesus as the Christ are reported with flexibility in the four Gospels. In Mark 8.29, Peter's response to the question, Whom do men say that I am? is simple and matter of fact. Thou art the Christ. In Luke 9.20, the answer is slightly longer. The Christ of God. To Christon to Theu. 
In Matthew 16, 16, the words son and living are added to the expressions reported in Mark and Luke, thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. Finally, in John, following the bread of life sermon, Peter responds to the question, will ye also go away by saying, we believe and are sure, that is, we have come to know that thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. The earliest New Testament manuscripts actually present Peter's terminology here in varying terms, confessing Jesus uh, in some cases to be the Holy One of God, the Christ, the Holy One of God, the Son of God, the Christ, the Son of God, or the Christ, the Son of the Living God. From this variance, one may conclude with confidence that formulaic rigidity was not the rule among the early Christians when it came to bearing personal testimony of Jesus Christ, although common key elements clearly run through these declarations. Third and finally here among the New Testament writers, it was Paul who took the further step of articulating in his statements of belief several specific dimensions or factors in the divinity of Jesus Christ elements that would become staples in later, more elaborate <clears throat> creedal formulations. In his first letter to Timothy, Paul called the following lyrical statement confessedly the great mystery of worship, namely that he, or God, the manuscripts read differently there, was manifest in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen of angels, preached in the nations, believed in the world, received in glory. On another occasion, writing to the Colossians, Paul bore his testimony of Christ as follows. All things were created by him and for him, and he is before all things, and by him all things consist. And he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead that in all things he might have preeminence. For it pleased the Father that in him should all fullness dwell, and having made peace through the blood of, of his cross, by him to reconcile all things unto himself. In these two confessions of faith, Paul encapsulates the main elements of his Christology, namely Jesus' incarnation at birth, confirmation at the, uh, by the Spirit at baptism, visitation by angels at the transfiguration, proclamation by his apostles, reception by faithful followers, and exaltation at the ascension, together with uh, his roles in creation, revelation, resurrection, perfection, crucifixion, and atoning reconciliation. Although Paul waxes eloquently expansive in these declarations, his words here remain in the sphere of personal expression by Paul, who himself preached Christ crucified unto the world, baptized in his name, was himself a personal witness to the resurrection, and so on. Nevertheless, it is not hard to see in these words and phrases historical and theological assertions that will eventually become key components in later Christian formulaic creeds. Now contrast New Testament statements with the early Christian creeds as they began to develop. As time progressed, the early Christian leaders and councils adopted creed after creed, slowly adding points of deviating doctrine incrementally, little by little, until eventually a considerable number of odd and incorrect doctrines had been intermingled with the originally valid and truthful elements. Beginning around 200 AD, Christians began to espouse and require each, each other, of each other adherence to particular creeds demonstrating and propagating their belief in Jesus Christ. Such creeds seemed needful because many people were teaching a wide range of doctrines about Jesus. Indeed, some of these heretical groups were way off the mark. Creeds functioned in many ways that, taken at face value, must have seen, seemed salutary. They could serve as baptismal interview questions to be asked of an initiate before they were baptized. They could also serve as catechisms to prepare converts for baptism as general guidelines for personal belief, as expressions of testimony, as collective declarations of belief, and as texts for unifying speech acts, binding congregations together. At first, the main purpose of these creeds seems to have been more 
a matter of self-definition by the community and admission into the community rather than anathematization and exclusion. Early Christians were mostly interested in encouraging and allowing people to join the church. And accordingly, variety and informality of the earliest creeds manifests little interest in imposing uniformity on all believers or in making exclusive truth claims that one formulation was orthodox and the other was heterodox. But as these statements developed, the tendencies of creedal formulations went too far in the direction of absolutism, taking the liberty of the pure and simple spirit that had prevailed in the apostolic era and prescribing and imposing extensive definitions and boundaries on the faithful. Especially when Christianity became the state religion in the Roman Empire in the fourth century, the permissive and admitting roles of creedal statements became irrelevant, or at least less relevant. Joining the church was taken for granted. Thus, the church changed its emphasis to focus on regulating the internal affairs of the church and formulating rules that could be used to require consistency of belief among all members. As the following discussion and the chart in the, uh, in the conference proceedings volume, which you uh, can acquire, or the chart uh, in the handout that you have will demonstrate, this trajectory became increasingly extreme as time went on. As has been discussed in detail by others, uh, credited in my footnotes, what began in the second and third centuries as fairly straightforward and unproblematic declarations in the Old Roman, Apostles, and Caesarean creeds became more and more arcane, philosophical, and delimiting in the fourth and fifth centuries. This process of accretion, adding phrase on phrase from creed to creed, is readily visible in the chart that I've given you. As you scan across from one column to the next, you can see as time goes on how these creeds became more and more complicated. For example, in the left-hand column, one of the earliest Christian creeds, the old Roman form of the Apostles' Creed, is given. As you read down that column, you will see that this creed is relatively brief and, for the most part, unproblematic. No Latter-day Saint would quarrel with its succinct opening statement, I believe in God the Father Almighty and in Jesus Christ, His only begotten Son, our Lord. One might wonder, however, about the creed's omission of the Holy Ghost as a member of the Godhead, although the Holy Ghost is mentioned in the next phrase in connection with the miraculous birth of the Savior. One might also wonder about the insertion at the bottom of that column in the Old Apostles' Creed of belief in the Holy Church. Understood in a proper sense of declaration of authority to act in the name of God, this element is probably acceptable to Latter-day Saints. But as a claim that the Church itself is somehow holy or perfect or infallible, this would begin to raise concerns. Moving to the right across the columns, it is easy to see how these elements became observably more complicated. To the original, I believe in God the Father Almighty, was added in the third century the phrase, maker of heaven and earth. And then in the fourth century, in the Caesarean Creed, this became maker of all things visible and invisible which then evolved a few years later in the old Italian form of the creed into ruler and creator of all ages and creatures. As well intended as these embellishments might have been, they introduce increasingly unnecessary claims or descriptions that lay themselves open to error or possible misunderstanding. For example, should the creed declare that God the Father is the creator, or should, it be, or should that role be attributed to the Son, as in John chapter 1 uh, or Colossians 1? The 4th century Caesarean statement, along with the 4th century pronouncements in the Nicene Creed, attempted to recognize both of the members of the Godhead as creators, Jesus Christ, by whom also all things were made, or simply by whom all things were made, we find in the creeds. But this alternative was not embraced in the fifth century symbol of Chalcedon, by which time the inseparability of the Father and the Son had come to prevail. 
Or again, what does it mean to create all things visible and invisible? What do these words add to the statement that God created all things? Uh, and how is the word create to be understood here? Why limit the declaration tautologically, as in the old Italian form of the Apostles' Creed, to being the creator of all creatures? One can see how the creeds would have been better off leaving such statements unstated than making such statements that would in inevitably run the risk of being misunderstood or being wrong. Most controversial were the increasing attempts of the creeds to define the nature of Jesus Christ and his relationship to the Father. In the early years, it was sufficient to recognize Jesus as the only begotten Son. As time went on, elaborations moved from Word of God, God of God, Light of Light in the Caesarean formulation to Light of Light, Very God of Very God, Begotten Not Made, being of one substance with the Father in the Nicene Creed, to consubstantial with the Father according to the Godhead and consubstantial with us according to the manhood in two natures, inconfusedly, unchangeably, indivisibly, as is stated in the symbol of Chalcedon. Well, it may be true that the Nicene Creed served an important purpose by defending the eternal divinity of Jesus Christ against the Arian doctrine that Jesus himself was created ex nihilo by the Father. It may also be true that the Nicene cure was as bad as the ailment, for neither Arius nor Athanasius seemed to have understood the premortal existence of any of God's children, including that of his firstborn son. Even more problematic, arcane, and obscure is the so-called Athanasian Creed in the far right on the column of the chart. It was never adopted by any council and therefore is not truly a creed with any official status. Indeed, it is of unknown authorship, but probably dates to the 7th or 8th centuries. Even as an unofficial statement, it demonstrates how far things had progressed by that time in drafting statements of belief that were more statements of what cannot be comprehended and known than they were statements of what one can believe and testify of. If not erroneous, many of its declarations at least seem confusing and unscriptural, although intermingled with truth, such as its correct statement that at Christ's coming all men shall rise again with their bodies and shall give account for their own works. Now my purpose in comparing these representative versions of the early Christian creeds is not to attempt anything here like a comprehensive discussion of the complex histories, philosophical debates, and ecclesiastical struggles that stand behind each of these formulations. That information can readily be found in several excellent studies of the early Christian creeds by such scholars as Philip Schaff, uh, J.N.D. Kelly and Yaroslav Pelikan. Uh, my purpose here is simply to point out that the expansion of the creeds moved away from the simple declarations of faith that prevailed in the first century and that in that growing development one can see clearly increasing evidences of the incremental progression of the apostasy. As time went on, the creeds became more complex, more arcane, more problematic. And the farther from their New Testament origins they get, the more problematic they became. The history of the creeds offers us thus a window through which we can see the unfolding or unraveling of the apostasy in these early centuries. But Latter-day Saints should not condemn all creeds equally, for all creeds were not created equal. Yet even the early creeds began to sow seeds that would, in time, spawn more debilitating problems. By the end of the ancient era, one may see in the creeds that the apostasy was indeed in full sway, harboring doctrinal problems and errors, sometimes as much by what they did not say as by what they did say. The Protestant creeds then attract our next attention. For many centuries, the works of the councils that produced these main creeds remained uh, within the unified realm of the universal or Catholic Church. Indeed, the main purpose of these early creeds was to create or impose uniformity of belief according to these standards of orthodoxy. 
But inevitably, such superimposed uniformity would lead to protest and conflict. And with the Protestant Reformation beginning in the 16th and 17th centuries, creeds reached a third and even more problematical stage. Creeds now became statements of belief formulated for the purpose of distinguishing and differentiating one religious group from another. Into the 17th and 18th century, the number of creeds, creeds climbed and the verbosity and complexity of these confessions soared. While all this positioning may have been understandably necessitated by the political and rational forces that surrounded various Protestant denominations, the result was precisely as Joseph Smith's experience depicts. Confusion, dissension, and self-serving manipulation characterized much of the religious fervor of his day, erupting in many cases, not only against the Mormons, in hostility, persecution, and violence. By 1820, numerous creeds of various denominations had been brought into existence. It may come as a surprise to many to see how many there were. The main Protestant creeds are collected and translated conveniently in the works of uh, Philip Schaff and of uh, Pelican and Hoskus. Chronologically listed, here are among a few of the Eastern and Catholic creeds. A sampling of those creeds would include the following. First, we have, uh, beginning in the 1340s, we have confessions from uh, the, uh, some Eastern confessions from Ephesus, uh, which of course are Orthodox, Eastern Orthodox, but then beginning in the uh, 1400s, we have Protestant manifestos from Switzerland and Germany, such as 67 articles from Zwingli in 1523, the Schleichtheim Confession in 1527, 10 theses from Bern in 1528, Luther's Catechism in 1529, the Augsburg Confession in 1530, the First Confession of Basel in 1534, the Wittenberg Concord in 1536, the Lausanne Articles in Switzerland from 1536 again, 10 articles more, the Geneva Confession, the Dogmatic Decrees of the Council of Trent, and so on. Next we see creeds coming from England, France, Scotland, Belgium, Germany, and Poland, even Saxony and Transylvania current-day current Romania. For example, the uh, Anglican Catechism, 1549, the Gallican Confession in 1559, we have a Scottish Confession in 1560, uh, from Belgium in 1561, Heidelberg, Germany, 1563, 39 articles from the Church of England in 1563 as the Church of England is separating from the Catholics, uh, we have uh, a Catholic confession in 1646, another S Switzerland confession in the 1560s, a Polish Brethren's Confession in 1574, a reply to the Augsburg Confession in 1576, the, the, the Transylvanian Confession in 1579, the King's Confession 1581, Scottish Confession 81, Cologne, Germany 1591, Saxony, 1592, and so on. The Puritan and Separatist movements generated several creeds and articles of faith in England, especially during the English Revolution in the 1640s and 50s, at much the same time as the Thirty Years' War was raging on the continent. We have here the true confession of Brownist Separatists in 1596, Arminian Articles in 1610, Canons of Dort, London Confession in 1644, the Westminster Confession in 47, the Cambridge Platform of Congregationalists in 48, uh, a confession trying to restore the primitive general pattern of uh, the Baptists in 1651, and so on. After the religious wars settled down, creeds were produced by various groups such as the Waldensians, the Anglicans, the Quakers, the Baptists, the Moravians, the Mennonites, Methodists, the Shakers, and the Universalists. We won't take time to name each one of these, but as you can see uh, from the listing here, on into the time when Joseph Smith was born and during his lifetime, there were numerous creeds uh, that were argued about and 
that plagued the, uh, the world into which Joseph Smith was born. Even during Joseph Smith's lifetime, other creeds and confessions would continue to be promulgated, especially now <clears throat> in America. And these would include a confession of the Presbyterian Church <clears throat> in 1829, a declaration of the Congregationalists in 1833, a New Hampshire confession in 1833, Presbyterian in 1837, and so on. One of the most salient features of all of these creeds is their length. They tended to be very long. The Belgic Confession of Faith, a Calvinist creed, runs 9,000 words. And the Westminster Confession contains approximately 12,500 words. The other creeds of that period all have thousands of words and numerous articles. The Calvinist canon of the Synod of Dort, for example, has 59 articles. The London Baptist of Confession, 53, and the Belgic, 37. Another important feature of these creeds is their polemic stance. As important as saying that one believed, what one believed was also saying what one did not believe, and how the tenets of one denomination differed from those of another. The Baptist Confession of 1688, for example, which is the most generally accepted Baptist confession in England and in the southern states in America, uh, says about the following about Catholicism. The Lord Jesus Christ is the head of the church. Neither can the Pope of Rome in any sense be the head thereof, but is no other than Antichrist, that man of sin and son of perdition that exalted him, himself in the church against Christ and all that is called God, whom the Lord shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. The Confession of Faith uh, in Scotland similarly uh, targets the uh, papistical kirk, uh, church, or community of Catholics as being false priests, priests and criticizes specific practices and beliefs. You get the idea that these uh, quotes were, or these uh, creeds were particularly polemic in their nature. Other creeds go out of their way to deal bluntly with what they consider to be specific heretical doctrines uh, from Christian history. The LDS Articles of Faith offer a much different perspective, much more conciliatory in tone. Let them worship how, where, or what they may. The combative nature of the Protestant creeds is also evident by their dates. Many of these confessions coincide with the dates of Henry VIII and his schism from Rome and the Thirty Years' War or the Cromwellian Revolution as well as the tumultuous times of the, of the First and Second Awakenings in the mid-18th and early 19th centuries. Perhaps it was most of all in reference to these bloody battles, divisive contentions, and coercive tactics that the creeds of Christianity merited the term abomination in the words of the 1838 account of the First Vision. That word, of course, is offensive and jarring to our friends of other faiths. But what would that word have meant in Joseph Smith's day? Indeed, it was a very strong word in the vocabulary of Joseph Smith's America. Webster's 1828 dictionary defines abomination as extreme hatred or detestation, the object of detestation, hence defilement, pollution, or in a physical sense, evil doctrines and practices which are moral defilements. Nevertheless, an abomination in the biblical sense can include, as well, anything that takes a person away from God or his righteousness. The Bible uses the word abomination in connection with a wide range of sin or transgression, including idolatry, deviating sexual conduct, eating ritually unclean animals, witchcraft and divination, and dishonest business dealings. Proverbs 6, 9, 16 to 19, gives a list of seven things that are called an abomination unto God, and the list includes things that one might thought have been uh, of lesser uh, status. A proud look, a lying tongue, and hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that deviseth wicked imaginations, feet that be swift in running to mischief, a false witness that speaketh lies, and a final and perhaps utmost abomination on this list, he that soweth discord among brethren. 
Thus, seeing the creeds as an abomination may readily be conflated with the problems that they had caused, as identified in the First Vision accounts, namely, turning people aside from the gospel as it had originally been delivered in its simplicity, teaching incorrect doctrines and obscure, uh, obscure uh, statements, and conf causing conflict, controversy, and corruption. Latter-day Saints typically hasten to say that our articles of faith, drawn from Joseph Smith's 1842 Wentworth letter and canonized in the Pearl of Great Price, do not constitute a creed. Authoritative statements found in LDS literature are not viewed as elements in a creed. For example, although its 13 articles of faith are scriptural, they are open-ended. They are not a creed in the traditional Christian sense. The articles of faith are marvelous, a marvelously abridged summary, less than 400 words, of the basic beliefs of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Nevertheless, it's also interesting to note that the main topics covered in our Articles of Faith are commonly covered in most of these other confessions, although articulating considerably different points of view on these subjects. Topics typically addressed in the Protestant confessions and creeds include the nature of the Godhead, the fall of Adam and original sin, human responsibility, the atonement of Jesus Christ, baptism, communion through faith and repentance, belief in the Bible, and empowerment of civil government to enforce orthodoxy. Rarely, however, will the traditional creeds or confessions address such questions as the qualification to hold the priesthood or officiate in the ministry, the liberty of worshiping according to the dictates of one's own conscience, and other topics of that, that nature. Absent also from the typical creeds is virtually any mention of the numerous gifts of the Spirit, the Second Coming, the Millennium, and the future restoration of the House of Israel, or, of course, uh, a belief in the Book of Mormon as the Word of God. These similarities and differences notwithstanding, the major problems caused by the traditional creeds are decisively nowhere visible in the Articles of Faith. Those 13 statements are short, clear, and simply declarative. They are also preventatively and generatively open-ended. It is no small matter that the expansive and inclusive words all and so forth appear in Articles of Faith 3, 6, 7, 9, 13, and most expansively in the form of the ninth Article of Faith, we believe all that God has revealed, all that He does now reveal. In sum, I hope that this brief look at the creeds of Christianity has accomplished these purposes. We have seen that the accounts of the first vision identify several problems raised by or in conjunction with the creeds. No specific malady was exclusively singled out. Second, the problems were involved as much with conflict as with content. The concern was not just with what the creeds said, but how they were used. Third, a three-stage development from the New Testament to early Christian creeds to Protestant confessions is clearly visible. The loss of important truths of the gospel, of key covenants, and of plain and precious parts of the scriptures may well have happened in that order in a very early stage in, in early Christian history. But the impact of the apostasy was not felt all at once, but continued incrementally for years to come. Fourth, the earliest Christian creeds were not as bad as one might have thought. In the first few centuries, Christian statements of belief remained largely unobjectionable from a Latter-day Saint point of view. Fifth, as centuries went on, the error